afternoon, we have a distinguished panel uh, of, of uh, friends and scholars, uh, and it will be moderated by the otherwise immoderate uh, uh, Don Boudreau, my uh, honored colleague from the Department of Economics. Professor? Thank you, Dean Dan. Uh, looking at this list of people in this panel, I, and this is the truth, I've been in a lot of panels in my in my short life. I don't think I've ever been in one with as many distinguished people on this, except for me. Uh, as I, so I'm, I'm honored to, to moderate this panel. Before we start, I do want to relate one story, just because I have the power of the mic. Todd Zwicky's heard this story before, but I'd like to take some credit for Todd becoming uh, one of the world's leading bankruptcy scholars. He was a year behind me uh, in law school at UVA. And uh, it was probably, I think it was my second year and Todd's first year. And back then, the law school at UVA was a really unfortunately designed building. It was very narrow, and students would have to walk very close to each other when they're going from classroom to classroom. And I had a bankruptcy law class with Tom Jackson, and I passed Todd, and Todd and I had been friends for a few years. And, and I said, Hi, Todd. And he said, What are you taking? He saw my, tech, my, my case book, bankruptcy law. He said, That sounds boring. I said, actually, it's pretty good. You could, you know, Todd, actually. And so I have, sure it had nothing to do with, with Todd becoming an expert in bankruptcy law, but I fancy that's a few pieces of influence that, pieces of influence that I've had in my life. Um, we're now on to the, uh, 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 the, the third of the three great scholars uh, uh, who have died in the past 12 months, uh, Jim Buchanan. I also want to mention, there's... A fourth person who's died, who, who, who's died, who fits into this mold. I don't know that there's been any 12-month period in which uh, uh, a good, sound, liberal, classical liberal scholarship has lost so many solid people as in the past 12 months. Ronald Coase, of course, died at the beginning of, of September. That's quite a loss. Uh, uh, the speakers uh, today will go in alphabetical order. Each will have between. 12 and 15 minutes to speak, and then we'll have some reactions and some time for Q&A, hopefully. Uh, the first speaker is my colleague, uh, Pete Becky. Uh, Pete's the only person that I know uh, who lives in an alternative universe with 28 hours in his day. So he's here now, and he's also somewhere else, but <laughs> Pete. I think they, they have a PowerPoint loaded up for me, so I... I'm going to stand up to be one bit. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here. I was going to mention about Ronald Coase, and I'll bring him up as well um, in this talk. Um, so uh, this is uh, uh, my paper. Uh, Henry uh, Butler contacted me, or the people kind of me, asked me to come here, and I, uh, they were going to do a session on Buchanan's contributions to constitutional political economy. and. So I had this opportunity to come and, of course, you know, jumped at it. We've been doing a fair amount, Dick Wagner and I have been doing a fair amount of uh, celebrating of Jim Buchanan's scholarship and his life uh, over the last uh, um, uh, year. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to figure out what you're going to say that might be different than what you've said before, because there's only so many things you can say. But Buchanan has a very rich uh, intellectual tradition and its relationship to various different strands of thought. I really like Todd's talk about the George Mason tradition. Uh, the other conference that I'm at uh, this week is a Liberty Fund co-sponsored conference with us uh, in the economics department at George Mason. And uh, it's called Adam Smith Fellows. And we gave all the students the t-shirts with a picture of Adam Smith on it. And it says, Economics with Attitude, which is, that's how we think of our George Mason economics tradition. Uh, when it's done right, um, not all my colleagues agree with that, but that's their problem. Uh, but we're trying to, you know, keep this tradition going. But uh, all right, so very simple. Sorry for the complicated things here. Is that if you know, there's the one takeaway here. It's kind of this slide, which is that in Buchanan's perspective on things, economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. Um, the political economists should not act as if they were pro-offering advice to an omniscient and benevolent despot. One of the things that's real challenging to people that are interested in public policy with respect to this is in Jim Buchanan, one of his first papers that was published in the JPE, it's called the Pure Theory of Government Expenditure, he challenges the very core idea that you can have a unified 
public entity that is, in fact, determining public policy. And he says, look, that's just not the way that you should go about doing public policy advice. And then right on the heels of that is all this critique of Arrow's theorem and the nature of the social welfare function and whatnot. And, and so you think about what Buchanan does in all of his work in public economics. It's imagine that you could do public economics but without any reference or recourse to a social welfare function. What would welfare economics look like? What would, what would uh, public economics look like? Um, <clears throat> and so what it will look like is, in fact, uh, an issue of the exchanges that take place within that realm, uh, that nexus, that political nexus, political legal nexus. Public economics work implicitly as a political philosophy, so it's better to make it explicit. The positive political economist can combine the reformist zeal that attracts people to the discipline of economics in the first place with the strict scientific demands. And I'll explain you know, how he tries to do that in, in a second. Uh, the most important function of the uh, of economics as a public science is its didactic role in teaching the principles of spontaneous order to students. One of the things that's fascinating in Buchanan's ideas, and you think about books like Cost and Choice, which, which Todd made reference to, the subtitle of which is like elementary, elementary Explorations or something into economics. Buchanan insisted on the basic principles of economics. And part of the reason why economists create nuisance in society, he says, is because they get bored with the principles of economics and they go around <laughs> imagining things that they could invent. But instead, they should just go back to these core principles. And then finally, and hopefully if I get to this, the idea is that the contemporary classical liberal political economists must capture the imagination of intellectuals and the public today, again, uh, with concerns about justice of the liberal order, freedom and responsibility, and the vision of a self-ordering and market economy that can inspire a new generation. Now, the reason why I bring this up at the end, and I'm not sure that I'll get all the way around to this, but one of the things that's most fascinating about Buchanan, and also most fascinating about Coase, um, is that all the way to the end of their life, they were constantly intellectually still pursuing things. Ronald Coase just published a book a year ago. He did a podcast with our colleague, uh, you know, Russ Roberts, not that long ago. He's 102 years old, right? And he's still like, oh, and Jim Buchanan, I went and saw a talk by Jim Buchanan in August a year ago. Uh, and uh, Buchanan got done with the paper, and he says, well, I'm still not quite happy with the way I formulated that. i got to rewrite that paper. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh. You know. So here he is in his, in his 80s and 90s, and he's saying, look, can I identify what are the crucial problems with classical liberal political economists that they face today? These are papers in the last decade of his life. And he's sitting here, and he's saying, look, you know, you have to cope with the problem of justice and the demands for justice, and we have to come up with an answer to that if we're going to sort of move forward. Um, he wrote a, a paper in the 70s called Natural and Artifactual Man, which says man wants freedom to become the man he wants to become. So Buchanan took it as, uh, you know, sacred. When I was a student, he, uh, he liked to quote literature, right? So he was an English literature major as well as an e economics major. And one of the things he used to say to us was he quoted something from Camus, which was he said, you know, baboons build their own cages, don't they? You know, and then he, you know, would ask us to think about it and stuff. And, you know, he wanted us to sort of understand this freedom. Well, then he, and later in his life, he comes, he writes this essay called Afraid to be Free. Where he says, well, what if it's, we've gotten to a situation where people are actually afraid to be free. We don't have to worry about managerial socialism anymore. We don't have to worry about uh, necessarily paternalism, though of course we do have to worry about the state wanting to be your parent. But what we really need to worry about is parentalism. That is the demand by the populace to want to have a parent to protect them from the vagaries of, of society. So he said, look, you've got to confront that challenge. And then finally, again, this idea of the invisible hand and the importance of the invisible hand in the wake of, like, say, the financial crisis. So his argument he made, I don't know if we made reference to this this morning, unfortunately I'm missing a lot of this conversation, but you know, Buchanan spent a lot of time since 2008 trying to distance the old Chicago school from the new Chicago school, and what's wrong with the new Chicago school versus what's great about the old Chicago school. And, and in a nutshell, here it is. The old Chicago school worried about the framework. It was about the right rules of the game. You play the game within a set of rules. Not that no matter what game you were in, the play would come out perfect. 
you could have really bad games if you had really bad rules. And so Buchanan's argument is that a lot of what happened in the financial crisis emphasizes the fact that people weren't paying appropriate enough attention to the rules of the game in which the game was being played. All right. So, Don, you've got to stop me on my time, okay? So tell me how much time I have. Okay, you have seven minutes. Okay, great. So what I do in the paper is we walk through, it's a co-author paper with my, my colleague at the department, uh, Leah Palagashvili, um, and it it's, uh, sort of walks through this sort of argument about Buchanan, and we go through various different papers of his. One of them is, what should economists do? Um, which is a, a, one of his classic statements about what the task of the economists um, should do when they abroad. So we shouldn't be focused on allocation mechanisms. Instead, we should be studying the market and exchange. Economics should be, as I said before, about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. My wife always makes fun of me because I PowerPoints, I use too small a font and stuff and too much information. It's supposed to be a PowerPoint. She goes, it's a PowerPoint, Pete, not a power paragraph. But uh, <laughs> uh, throwing these, these sort of quotes up there, and I don't necessarily want you to read them, but think there. But I, this paper in the Journal of Law and Economics in 1959 is a classic. And I think one of the cool things about like the Coast and Buchanan relationship, because you got to remember they were colleagues at this time is the uh, kind of ways in which each of them are taking their stabs at developing a theory of comparative institutional analysis. And so in the SEC paper, uh, for example, I think there's a great uh, you know, line uh, in, the, in the Journal of Law and Economics, which is like around page 18 or whatever in the upper right corner. Uh, Coase says this thing where he, he says, look, he goes, my, you know, my novel theory, and then he has in parentheses, you know, novel to Adam Smith. Not <laughs> right? so the basic idea is that economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. And when we shift those institutions to a world that's absent of the private property market economy, Coase identifies the three things that you're going to have to deal with as costs. Right? Those are the absence of monetary calculation, the inability to use dispersed knowledge, all right, and the problem of the play of special interest groups. And he sums it all up. And he says, by the way, this isn't novel to me. It's novel to Adam Smith. And that's actually how I think that you know, both Hayek and Buchanan and then Coase, they all sort of see themselves in that light. And so the question is, what is the positive political economist supposed to do with respect to sort of welfare economics? And what Buchanan suggests there is that our reforms should all be about the structural rules of the game that we offer as hypotheses to the body po uh, politic, and then the economist steps out. The economist doesn't have any privileged position in this, and this relates back to what Todd was talking about with respect to Buchanan's criticism of Posner uh, in that, and that the good economics, bad, bad uh, um, you know, law. That's also a, a very Knightian position, because the idea of the economist as the expert who can design and fix things as a social engineer is in Knight's uh, framework a violation of the strictures of what you should be doing. All right, so other uh, things, the structural puzzle of political economy that Buchanan puts us all through, which is basically the old adage, you know, who guards the guardians. I don't know how many people remember when Buchanan won the Nobel Prize, but, you know, at the time it was very common for the news people to ask people to sum up their Nobel Prize address in very short things. So, you know, James Tobin said, don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, these kind of things. And they asked Buchanan, I don't know if any really people remember this, but he said, they said, how do you sum up your ideas? He says, you don't let the fox guard the chicken coop. of these things. And this is Buchanan's play of the structural puzzle that we all have to confront. That we empower the protective state, we empower the productive state, but how in doing that do we restrain the redistribute over the churning state or the rent-seeking state? So we try to talk about that idea. i got only two more slides left on. Um, what I want to suggest here is this Buchanan for the future. So Todd ended up by talking about the future. It seems to me that Buchanan's constitutional political economy is a live research program. It's not a dead research program. It's actually part of our ongoing conversation. And the issues that I think are the two most important ones that we come to grips with are the post-Soviet context and the financial crisis, both of which force us to deal with the idea of the importance of the framework in a world where the framework is, in fact, what had failed. 
So if you think about it this way, institutional problems demand institutional solutions. And so what we need to see is how is it that you come about that frame? We can't treat the rules of the game as exogenous. They are endogenous to the process, what you were talking about before in your thing about the evolution uh, of these ideas. Where do we get our idea from that? Well, from Jim Buchanan. Read this passage and re look at the date on it, 1968. He says, the economist should not be content with postulating models and then working within such models. His task includes the derivation of the institutional order itself from the set of elementary behavioral hypotheses with which he content, uh, commences. In this manner, genuine institutional economics uh, becomes, a, I forgot a word, becomes a significant uh, and important part of fundamental economic theory. Again, the idea here is how do you, you know, think about it this way. How do I derive from the self-interest postulate the invisible hand theorem? All right? In a lot of standard economics, the way you do that is you collapse one to the other. In the Buchanan framework, what you do is you derive the invisible hand theorem from the self-interest postulate via institutional analysis, which is also what Al Armin Alton did in, say, the, the uncertainty paper in 1950, and also what Coase is doing. And that institutional economics um, is what we should be going. Don's telling me that i got to wrap up. I apologize for going too long. I will leave this quote, and then I will end. This is it. I won't go any further. But this is, this is Jim Buchanan. I think this sums up what the, what the classical political economist needs to do. And this is Buchanan's notes at the founding of the Thomas Jefferson Center back in, at uh, University of Virginia. And by the way, just an advertisement for, for my colleague David Levy. If you are interested in the history of Coase and Buchanan, what David Levy and Sandra Perk are doing right now is going over the whole Thomas Jefferson controversy. The extremely big controversy in economics, what happened with the Ford Foundation and everything, and they're un, 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 uh, unearthing a lot of really fascinating things. But just look through this passage, and I'll just read it, and then that will be it. Uh, so what, they, uh, what the Thomas Jefferson Center was set up to do was to, quote, strive to carry on the honorable tradition of political economy, the study of what makes for a good society. Political economists stress the technically, technical economic principles that one must understand in order to assess alternative arrangements for pro promoting peaceful cooperation and productive specialization among free men. Yet, political economists go further and frankly try to bring out into the open the philosophical issues that necessarily underlie all discussions of the appropriate functions of government and all proposed economic policy measures. When I was listening to Todd Zawicki talk about the George Mason tradition in the law school, I think that that strives exactly what they're trying to get at. When I think about our George Mason Economics Department, when it's at its best, that's what I think we're all still trying to do. And in that regard, I think that's a great testimony to the vision and analysis that James Buchanan had to offer in his career. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll next hear from uh, uh, Dave Maddock, uh, an economist who teaches law at uh, Northwestern. Thank you. Well, Kevin is uh, setting this up, and I'll, um, I'll mention it like uh, like Peter. Uh, okay. I'm going to be dealing not only with Buchanan but with uh, with Coase. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is that uh, I'm dealing with uh, an article that Buchanan wrote with Stubblebine that I think is uh, a very important article, but not very well followed. And uh, I think that's a real that's a real tragedy. Uh, now we we could say it's a it's a definitely a tragedy that we lost these people. It's definitely a tragedy that, uh, among others, Ronald Post died recently. But it was also a blessing that we had him for uh, more than a century. So it's a different way of thinking of it. But certainly uh, certainly these two were uh, were giants. Now there are uh, there are a few words that you can mention or phrases sometimes that will, that are simply an, a, an open invitation for lawyers to charge in and start changing things. I've, I've jotted some of these down. Agency costs, you talk about agency costs. Okay, now, we need some intervention here. Information costs, well, then people can't, they, you know, they're not gonna be able to do the right thing for themselves. Uh, transaction costs, okay, let's get in there. 
a monopoly, so forth. And, uh, you know, putting aside the idea that sometimes these trade off. So if you, if, you, if you reduce one of them, you're going to increase another. You know, you really have, you'd have to think of those as a whole nest. Uh, but that's not, that's not the point I want to make here. I want to, the point I want to make here is I want, to, I want to mention a word that Terry Anderson hates, and that's externality. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's got his fingers in his ear. Uh, that, that's another word. You say externality, positive or negative, and that's just an open invitation for uh, for for the legal system to, to get in and start start uh, handling this. Now, one of the commonalities between Coase and Buchanan is that simultaneously they were working, I think it was independently, I don't think they, they actually uh, knew the other person was working on it, they were working on uh, some theories so along, in Coase and Buchanan's case, along the stubble line, working on some theories saying, well, well this is just vastly overstated. The idea that we've got to charge in and their externalities. And uh, Coase comes out first with his, the, the problem of social cost. And, uh, and Buchanan and Stubblebine come out a couple of years later. And uh, I don't know whether people, people were so, some people were so enraged by what Coase has said they weren't going to think about it anymore. And other people were so convinced that Coase had solved the problem. They weren't going to think about it anymore, but, uh, but the, this, this article, which was called Externality, uh, uh, seems to have, to have fallen through the cracks. Now, maybe one of the reasons is it was a little bit, the way they, the way they dressed it up is a little bit complex, and I, I have found when I teach it to my students, I can do it in a much simpler way, and they can understand it. So I'm going to do it in, a, in, a, in this simpler way, see if I can... I can make this thing work. I've managed to turn it off, I guess. Uh, there we go. Okay. This is okay. Here is here is the, the, the usual rendition of Coase theorem. Okay. You have you have it. Uh, you have people who most value a uh, uh, an entitlement and people who own it. And. If the, if the people who, if, and then you have, in the, in the Coase tradition, you have, uh, following uh, Pagu, he had negligible transactions costs, which, uh, you know, he got a lot of, a lot of flack for, but I, I see nothing wrong with that. And the other thing that Coase dealt with was you know, prohibitive transaction costs. And, and so the, 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 the great insight, as everybody knows, uh, that Coase made in the problem of social costs is if the transaction costs are, are negligible, then from an efficiency standpoint, you don't need to worry about who has the entitlement. The, the law doesn't have to figure that out. But if the wrong person has the entitlement, then it will be transacted one to the other. Okay, then you go over to the other end, the prohibitive transaction cost, and what Coase tells us is, well, in, that, in this case, the legal system needs to be sensitive to where the entitlement is, is, is assigned, because it's not assigned in the right place, then it's going to be, it's never going to get to the right place. But it doesn't give us much of a roadmap how to get from one to the other. Now, I, uh, just in passing, I'll, uh, uh, there's another article that I think is unduly neglected by John Prather Brown, uh, uh, where he's, he starts trying to, uh, to hash that out. But that's not going to be the, the context I'm talking about. The one thing you'll notice here is that you've got uh, negligible transactions cost at one end, and you got prohibitive transactions cost at the other end. But you got you don't have the thing in the middle, which is they aren't prohibitive, but they're not negligible either. They're transactions costs that are large enough that one might want to take into account. And this is where I think uh, uh, Buchanan and Stubblebite are really important. And so I'm I'm going to go to this, and I'm going to put in the middle. There's this third column, which is called significant transactions cost. So these. You don't want to you don't want to neglect them, but uh, but they're not going to defeat transactions. If you if the if the if the entitlement is misplaced, the, the entitlement will move, but it's going to be costly when it moves. Okay, now now we get to the relevant versus irrelevant externality business, and the uh, suppose you know we we might have negligible, significant, or prohibitive transactions costs. Suppose for the moment, we don't know that, let's just assume there's zero. Suppose we have zero transactions cost. Now, 
in many instances, you've got the person that values the entitlement the most is also the person that owns it. So the fact that, that it doesn't matter, it's not going to transact. Even with zero transactions costs, it's not going to move. So if that's the case, it doesn't matter what the transactions costs are. They can be significant or they can be prohibitive. It's irrelevant because even if they were zero, the transaction, the, the entitlement wouldn't move. Okay, these are the ones that I've shown in green over here. Those are irrelevant externalities. The, the right person owns them to begin with, so there's not going to be any, any transaction. Now, as far as the three columns are concerned, I'm not sure which of those is going to be the more likely, but if you look at the three rows, the ones that are designated one, two, three, or four in Roman numerals, it seems that as, a, as an entry condition, let's just assume those are equally likely. Now, now this is pretty, pretty amazing, it seems to me, because this says already we've got these green, these green bands here, these green rows, and it says we don't need to worry about externalities in those green rows. Because even with zero transactions costs, nothing would happen. So we can just get rid of half of, half of the diagram already. Okay, now the black part over there, that's the part where we got negligible transactions costs, so now we're back into the Cosian system where there's going to be an exchange. We can get rid of that too. Uh, so we're only left with the, the yellow and the, and the red parts as being potentially uh, problematic. Now, I have, another, I, have, I have other stuff that actually comes at the end of this. Uh, I, I published it in a, in, a, in a journal, a European journal. It seems to be totally uh, unobtainable in North America, and I kind of summarize <laughs> that at the end of my paper. Uh, but I'm not going to deal with that uh, here beyond saying that in that paper, that paper says that those green bands probably occupy more than a quarter apiece. So that really, we're not... If, if you expand each of those green bands, the, as, uh, the, the yellow and the red bands get smaller still. So we're dealing with, to say we're dealing with the yellow and red bands as potentially uh, problematic is, is an overstatement of the problem. Okay, now one of the things here that Buchanan, and Buchanan says in, in other places as well is with, with Stubblebine is, well, okay, you know, the costs are costs are costs. So, Suppose we have an externality problem. Let's go to the prohibitive part. Go over, over to the, the, uh, the red bands. Suppose you've got uh, prohibitive transactions costs, so you're not going to be able to internalize this externality. Uh, the, the, the free market can't. That's going to impose a cost. Oh, man, that's bad. But if, if the legal system intervenes in order to correct this, that's going to impose a cost, too. That imposes a direct cost because regulatory agencies and the courts and so forth, they occupy offices and they, they have manpower, but it's going, to, it's going to impose less significant costs as well because, because the, the regulator is not going, particularly with subjective values, the regulator is going to have very poor notions of exactly what the costs and benefits are. So even there, you, you've got to be measuring the cost of the externality if it's not controlled against the cost of controlling it. And there's no reason to believe a priori that the cost of controlling it is going to be less than, than the cost of the externality. If we go to the significant ones, then you've got more or less the same problem, uh, except uh, it's, the only difference there is that you will, you will move the entitlement. It's going to move at a, at a significant transactions cost which could be avoided by a Nirvana uh, government, but once we compare the real government, you need to compare the, the expectational cost of, of handling it some other way through institutions with the, with the cost of the externality. Okay, now I'll throw in... Uh, am I uh, running out of time yet? Okay. I'll throw in this, which uh, totally mystified pretty much everybody in the room except for uh, Fred McChesney. This is a kind of a, uh, it's an extension of something that uh, Fred and I did with uh, Menachem Spiegel. And uh, this, this relates back to the black box here because some, some people will say, okay, now, if you have negligible transactions costs, okay, the entitlements move, 
where they're supposed to go, but there are distributional consequences. Therefore, the, the argument that you're going to get an efficient outcome cannot be true, because you're going to get different outcomes depending on who owns it to begin with. Well, that's a mistake, and actually Coase, Coase mishandled this uh, in his notes on the problem of social cost. He kind of waved his hands. The way he should have the way he should have answered it is that the mistake is in assuming that an efficient allocation of resources is unique. That a Pareto efficient allocation of resources says you were on the contract curve. And uh, I can't move over there and also stay near the mic, but if you, you can't see those letters either, but we have, okay, you'll, when you look at the paper, and you can actually see that, <laughs> what you'll see is that you have two initial allocations and they have, they have trading lenses that do not overlap, which means you cannot possibly get to the same allocation if you start with one versus the other, allocation of the entitlement. But that doesn't mean that it's inefficient. If the transaction's costs are negligible, either way you're going to the, uh, going to the contractor. Uh, I, I, I was racking my brain trying to remember uh, when I had... Uh, how many times I had met uh, Jim Buchanan, I was asked to speak, I corresponded with him on, on a number of occasions, but I, I can only remember one occasion when I actually met him, and I was giving a, uh, giving a talk, and the talk was, it was in three parts. There was part number one, which you had to know, you had to understand to be able to make sense of part number two and part number three. Part number three was the really important part. Part number two was, uh, it was kind of interesting, but it wasn't essential. You could either go through two, or you could hop over to three. And so I went through one, and then I looked at my watch to see uh, if, I, if I had time to go through two, or if I needed to go straight to three. And Buchanan says, you don't have to use all of your time. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have a, uh, uh, we're double dipping at Northwestern in this panel. Uh, John begins. Democratic majoritarian 
process. The one exception was that specific prohibitions didn't, uh, the thing that legislation that violated specific prohibitions, like those in the Bill of Rights, that didn't get a presumption of constitutionality. But note, that doesn't mean, that doesn't talk about the enumerated powers, which are not specific prohibitions, or the separation of powers. Uh, and so uh, that creates a new vision of constitutional law, which I would call the progressive paradigm, which is deference uh, to majorities, particularly national majorities, but often uh, state majorities as well. The progressive paradigm undergoes a crisis in the Warren Court, because suddenly the Warren Court seems to be uh, not deferring uh, to uh, majorities, most famously, of course, in the Griswold case, in which it strikes down uh, rights to uh, contraception, on rather extravagant ideas of, well, there's you nothing, know, again, the Constitution, no specific prohibition, but there are penumbras in the Constitution that this uh, violates. That creates a crisis in constitutional theory, and I think it's then that originalism begins its comeback, and uh, I think quite correctly, it seemed to begin in Bork's uh, very famous article, very <coughs> referred to here, uh, 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 Neutral Principles and Some First Amendment Problems. I think one has to understand that article against the, the backdrop of the progressive paradigm, the strong sense of majoritarianism. Not because that's not only true in the United States as a whole, but also at, the, at Yale University, uh, famously uh, Bork's colleague, Alexander Bickel, also referred to before here, uh, talks about the counter-majoritarian difficulty. What justifies a court in striking down uh, the work of a majority? And while Bork's article uh, certainly uh, identifies Madison in some sense as the patron saint of the article and certainly wants to protect rights of minorities as well as majorities, it still has a strong majoritarian uh, flavor. And that's not at all surprising. It criticizes wrongly decided only cases uh, in which the, uh, like Grizzle Wall, in which the Supreme Court strikes down. Uh, some majority uh, uh, legislation, uh, and most famously, its theory of the First Amendment is a very much a democratic reinforcing theory. Uh, work actually doesn't do any historical work on the First Amendment, uh, but suggests that we protect political speech as opposed to other kinds of speech uh, because that is uh, in the interest of the overwhelming uh, principles of the Constitution of, uh, of, of self-government. So it's still very much within the majoritarian, I think, a paradigm of all still of the beginnings of, uh, uh, I think, of uh, a return to originalism. Here's where I think public choice comes and makes an important inflection point uh, in originalist theory. And it's both diffuse public choice and, in particular, uh, Buchanan's work with Gordon Cullock and Calculus of Consent. Diffusely, of course, public choice raises a lot of questions about majorities. Concentrated interest groups went out. There's a problem with rational ignorance. There's not uh, a lot of confidence that majoritarianism is going to be good. Uh, uh, calculus of consent raises questions about voting rules. There's no reason to privilege majoritarianism as the default rule. There can be a lot of different voting rules. Uh, depending on uh, external costs versus information costs. Majorities can impose external costs uh, on individuals. On the other hand, there are information costs uh, in making decisions that militate against very what we'll call inclusive rules, extremely supermajoritarian rules. And we've got to have a trade-off depending on the situation, depending on the kind of rule. And indeed, uh, Buchanan and Tullock specifically suggest that more inclusive voting rules are going to be needed for a constitution. So one way of understanding, I think, uh, the calculus of consent is it's a return uh, to a justification uh, for a constitution, a supermajoritarian constitution, uh, with features that are strongly constrained, constraining majoritarianism. And given that, it gives a new uh, impetus to originalism, and particularly some of the other particular features of the Constitution, like federalism and the separation of powers, uh, that can be justified uh, along public choice grounds. Federalism for exit reasons, separation of powers for other reasons. Suddenly there is a new justification that is completely contrary, I think, 
uh, to the progressive paradigm's assumption of majoritarianism. And I think that's a very important inflection point in the history of originalism. It changes originalism from a theory that is really reacting uh, to the excesses of judicial review to one that may become a pretty uh, aggressive theory of judicial review to strike down majoritarian legislation. Uh, let me just outline a few indications, I think, of the importance of this public choice inflection. One in constitutional theory, and another in actually what the Supreme Court does. In constitutional theory, originalism, recently, I think it's fair to say, has become a very fractured theory. A lot of people are originalists in the academy, coming from a lot of different starting points. But what's interesting to compare these starting points with the previous starting points for originalism is none of them begin with the central problem of the counter-majoritarian difficulty. None of them say, well, the real problem here is we're striking down uh, actions of the majority, which really should be privileged. Some begin, like my own work with uh, Mike Rappaport, uh, uh, very much along the Buchanan line. And let's, let's protect the results of a supermajoritarian process for making a constitution, which is the best way to make a constitution. Others uh, begin with a kind of classical liberal idea, but again, that doesn't go back to privileging uh, the majorities of the progressive paradigm. Still others really found their interest in, natural, in language theory, but again, that's not uh, privileging this majoritarian view. Uh, the Supreme Court, I think, is also uh, moving uh, uh, in uh, this direction. Uh, one sees that, I think, even in the transition from Justice Scalia uh, to Justice Thomas. Uh, Justice Scalia, I think, represents a somewhat older generation of originalists, someone who's very concerned about cabining uh, 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 judicial discretion, which I think in some sense is the flip side of uh, being concerned about uh, majoritarianism. And he is not as an aggressive uh, an exponent of judicial review under originalism as Clarence Thomas, a younger justice on the court. Moreover, I think one sees that the, the, the modern uh, court, uh, particularly when it's acting originally, is very much uh, asserting itself against majorities, either in the Second Amendment case or uh, in some of the structural cases, like the uh, NFIB versus Sebelius case, in which a majority of the court said, that, at least under the Commerce Clause, uh, that Obamacare was not justified under the Constitution. So I think those are very strong indications of the importance of the what I would call this public choice inflection point. Another strong indication is those who have not accepted the theories of public choice, generally uh, uh, people more on the left liberal side of the spectrum, have continued to be centrally concerned about the counter-majoritarian difficulty. They're still concerned about how are we going to put within the progressive paradigm an aggressive, uh, the kind of judicial review we would like. And that obviously raises a lot of difficulties. Uh, in the paper, I go through some of the possible uh, solutions to those difficulties. The most plausible solution, I've always thought, has been uh, that of John Hart Eli's uh, Democratic Reinforcing Judicial Review. One of the interesting things about uh, John, uh, John Ardili's famous uh, book, Democracy and Distrust, is it doesn't seem, at least in its treatment of democracy reinforcement, completely different from uh, 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 Judge Bork's uh, uh, principles, which are also, at least with the, the First Amendment theory, focus on uh, democratic reinforcement. But the difficulty with Ely's theory is that it really doesn't justify things like Roe versus Wade or the Griswold case. And so progressives, the people working within that paradigm, have had difficulty figuring out how to justify that. Well, one theory, for instance, uh, by Barry Friedman recently as well, there's, there's no difficulty. The Supreme Court actually follows the majority will. That's the best explanation of what we see for Supreme Court decision making. I don't find that an extremely plausible theory. I mean, Supreme, a majority of people would like to have prayer in schools, of course the Supreme Court is against that, uh, uh, this, uh, you can go down the list, the Supreme Court in its structure is much more likely to follow the, uh, the interests of, uh, of the elites of society rather than majorities at all, but there have been various attempts 
uh, to do this, I think, largely unsuccessful, but for my purpose here, what I think that reinforces the importance of public choice in the sense that those people have not really accepted uh, that paradigm for looking at politics still look at the counter-majoritarian difficulty as the essential problem for constitutional theory, whereas I don't think originalists do. So let me end very briefly with uh, that sort of, I think, in some sense, a good news story, for if you're sympathetic to originalism. But then I think there's a flip side of that. A public choice originalism, I think, raises some other very serious problems for originalism that I'm not sure originalists have dealt with. Let me take them in order. The first one is, is simply this. We are concerned about incentives, or what we might call design mechanism in an economic sense. Why should judges be originalists? What possible incentives do they have to be originalists? Is this just a kind of nirvana theory? Uh, I think there may be some answers to that. There may be some answers, uh, I think we may have heard before from John Harrison, the idea that uh, we, we get people who like to follow rules, and if we have a culture of originalism, as we did maybe in the 19th century, maybe that's an answer to it, but I don't think it's uh, a clear uh, answer. A second problem is the uh, problem uh, I, I went back to Buchanan and Tullock saying that we should have a constitution constituted by supermajoritarian voting rules, but how do we know we've got the right supermajority? Uh, I've argued before that, uh, unlike most scholars, uh, I don't think the Constitution in the past has been too difficult to amend. We've had very important amendments, but past uh, performance is no guarantee of future <laughs> results. And so how do we know today uh, that we've got the right uh, uh, voting rule? So that, I think, is... Uh, yet another problem. A third problem, and I'll end on, on, on this problem, is back to the problem of public choice, rational ignorance. Uh, the, um, uh, and this has been developed uh, by someone, of course, from George Mason, not surprisingly, Ilya Sobin is worried about for originalism. How are you going, if, if people are so rationally ignorant, uh, it's very important to understand what the Constitution meant at that time for those for those people. That's what originalism is. Well, how are we going to how are we going to figure that out if most people are rationally ignorant of politics? And or to put it another way, doesn't that undermine the benefits of the kind of supermajoritarian process that Buchanan and Tulloch uh, endorse in the calculus of consent? So I think it's a very different story of original, the history of originalism that is generally told. It generally is focused on, I think, small changes in interpretive theory from original intent to public meaning to constitutional construction. I think the biggest change in originalism has been the movement of conservative and libertarian and even uncommitted political scholars out of the progressive paradigm into the public choice paradigm which gives a, 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 a rationale uh, for a strong, aggressive kinds of originalism, but it also raises some questions uh, that I think original scholars need to address. Thanks very much. Now we'll commence with the, uh, with the comments. Uh, Max Stearns, uh, formerly of GMU Law, now uh, at Maryland. Thank you, everyone. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and privilege to be invited to speak on this uh, terrific panel and also as part of this fabulous conference. I just want to thank uh, Todd for inviting me and for helping put this together um, and all the organizers from the journal. Um, it's, it's just great to be here. I was going to start out by saying that uh, in addition to celebrating uh, Alchin Bork, and uh, Buchanan, uh, there are two other people who have recently passed away. One of them is famous, and the other one's my dad. And when I spoke at my dad's funeral, I said that in 21 years of teaching, I had yet to meet anybody who shared his constant enthusiasm for learning. And that's true. And I was thinking about why coming back to George Mason always feels like coming home. And, and, and that really has... Uh, 
It's something I've, I've, I've thought about, and I think the reason is that institutionally, this is as close as it gets. This is a place where everybody shares a love of learning, and it has always been that way since I've known it. And this is really something Henry Manny has every right to be proud of. It, it takes a lot to build a culture. It's one, it's one thing to encourage a few people, but to build an institutional culture that's sustained, even after your, uh, your time at the helm has come to an end, is really an inspiration. And, you know, it, it is a place, I, I, I remember the Tuesday workshops, it was my second law school education, probably better than the first one, frankly, <laughs> um, it's certainly harder hitting, and it really was uh, a way to learn how to rethink virtually everything I thought I knew about the law from completing law school, um, and so, so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to make a, a couple brief comments about the other folks who are, being, uh, who are being honored in this conference, not just Buchanan. Uh, Armin Alchin, so I went to the, uh, to, to the, the Henry Manny uh, Law and Economics Boot Camp up at Dartmouth. Armin Alchin was one of the lecturers, and I distinctly remember him giving uh, the following point at a lecture, uh, and he was talking about his selection of his wife, uh, and what he said was that the way it works is very simple. Uh, you've got two potential candidates for your spouse, and you get rid of the one that's less good. <laughs> and then you come up with another candidate for your spouse. You get rid of the one that's less good, and you continue the process until you realize that the likelihood that you're going to surpass the one that you're left with is so remote that you marry her. Uh, now, I have to say, he didn't influence my selection of a spouse. I was already married, but uh, he did influence my way of thinking about the world because what he described was a kind of internalization, one person, condor say, selection process. Binary comparisons till you get the one that defeats the others. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, profound. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and, and uh, Bork. So uh, what's my connection to, to Bork? Well, uh, as, as Todd pointed out, uh, I was apparently hired to, repl hired to replace him. And from what I understand, there were, there were two criteria. They were looking for a constitutional law person, somebody who was interested in constitutional law. And they were looking for somebody who took public choice seriously. I had just published an article called The Public Choice Case Against the Item Veto. That was my job talk. It turns out that where those two circles overlapped, that is con law and public choice, I was the only person standing uh, in 1991, 92, so they had to hire me. Uh, thankfully, facial hair was not a requirement to replace Robert Bork. Um, all right. Um, now, Buchanan, I have three things to say about Buchanan. One, uh, my first or second year teaching here, I was presenting a paper over in Fairfax that became an article that I wrote called The Misguided Renaissance of Social Choice. And I was setting up this detailed discussion of this Dormant Commerce Clause case called Castle v. Consolidated Freightways, and I was going to try to demonstrate that there's an embedded potential uh, intransitivity within that case, and I went through all the issues extremely, or was going to go through all the issues extremely carefully, and Jim Buchanan sitting in the front row uh, next to somebody who I don't recall, I thought it might have been Dick Wagner, but I don't think it was, uh, and I'm about a third of the way through the presentation when Jim Buchanan audibly mutters under his breath, oh, it's a multidimensional case, uh, which meant that every <laughs> Everything else I had to say was sort of beside the point. He got it. It was time to move on. Uh, and it demonstrated to me how unclever I actually uh, was. Yet, I was invited to serve on a dissertation committee uh, on which he was a member. And that was truly a great honor. Truly great honor. And the last thing I'll say about him, uh, and Henry, Henry Manny you might remember this, uh, when Henry put together a panel of economists fairly early on at the time that I was here uh, that included Jim Buchanan, advice that these economists would give to President Clinton. And Buchanan gets up in a large, you know, large speaker audience, gets in front of the mic, and he says, Mr. President, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was just, just uh, clever and, uh, and terrific. OK, uh, so I want to make a few comments about the papers. And I want to start, uh, and I'll go through them um, fairly quickly, but I do want to uh, comment first on the paper uh, by, by Pete Becky. Um, and the, the main point of this paper, as I understand it, as I read it, is uh, that economics, as Buchanan understood, was about the processes rather than the outcomes. In other words, it was about the processes 
that generated the outcomes rather than the specific outcomes that those processes generated. And the two quotes that just epitomize that for me, one is on page 16 of the paper, and I just absolutely love this quote by Buchanan, uh, and so I'm going to just read it to you. It says, um, but the market is the institutional embodiment, embodiment of the voluntary exchange processes that are entered into by individuals in their several capacities. That is all there is to it. I love that. <laughs> in other words, studying the market means you're studying the processes through which the exchange uh, comes about that creates whatever it happens to create. That is all there is to it. And in a way, the irony of the assertion that that's all there is to it is how much there is to saying that's all there is to it, meaning the contrast of what it isn't. What simply is to say, in Buchanan's economics world, the market's a process, it's not an outcome or set of outcomes. Which is to say, we shift the focus from the whiteboard, which in his day was a blackboard, um, and from the, sh the, the, the shifting curves and the change in equilibria and comparative statics to an understanding that we have to step back from this whole thing and not lose sight of the forest for the trees, because really the best the economists can do is articulate and define the process and then allow the process to bring about the set of results uh, that it brings about. And that, frankly, uh, unless we're hubristic, we need to recognize that we do not necessarily uh, fully understand. Um, the second quote that I want to read is at page 13, so it's prior to it, uh, relative to the quote that I just read in the paper, and this is actually a quote by Pete. It's not a quote by Buchanan, but it's so Buchanan-esque that I, I do want to read it. Um, he says this, he says, the profit and loss mechanism provide market participants with the judgment of their decision making, and here's the key part, in the very discrepancy between ex ante expectations and the ex post realization in the market motivates the discovery or learning by economic actors of better ways to match their production plans with consumption demands. I love this quote because what this quote suggests is that the market process is a dynamic one that thrives on an appreciation of the consequences of failure. In other words, you have a set of ex-ante ex expectations. Henry Manny did a recent, uh, is doing a project on entrepreneurs. And we had this conversation, what's the role of the field entrepreneur? You have folks who go in, they think they've got a great idea, they think it works, they pitch it, it goes like a lead balloon. And what is it that motivates our thinking? It's understanding the relationship between the ex ante and the ex post. We have a transaction, we think it's going to work out, it fails. But that motivates us to study not just the actors in the economy, it motivates the economists to study the dynamics of the economy and the nature of the transactions, which is to say, once more, it's about the process. And that's an enormously valuable, um, an enormously valuable insight that captures something essential about who Buchanan was. Of course, the other aspect of who Buchanan was was his understanding of the difference between constitutional rules and policy, policy making within the confines of those rules. And that, I have to say, is something that has uh, profoundly influenced the way Todd and I wrote our public choice course book. In fact, when I went back and looked at the Nobel speech that Buchanan gave, and then looked back at the course book that Todd and I wrote, I realized once more how uncreative we really were. The structure of the book at a micro level and at a macro level really maps onto his understanding of the role of institutions, methodological individualism, and the like, um, and it really is a profound, uh, profoundly important way to frame your thinking about institutions um, and the roles that they play in creating ultimate public uh, public policy. Um, so let me uh, let me move on and make a few comments about uh, John McGinnis's paper, which I also greatly enjoyed, especially the second time reading it. Um, and he is making a set of observations about the relationships between two schools that don't obviously have much to do one with the other. And that is originalist constitutional scholars on the one hand, public choice theorists on the other. And I asked him a little bit about this because I'm skeptical, frankly, that originalist constitutional scholars 
are doing a lot of active reading in the public choice literature, but he's not claiming that. He's claiming it's in the ether. It's sort of out there in the environment in a way that's influencing the framing and the thinking. So that what had once been a set of arguments about the counter-majoritarian problem now embed within them a set of skepticisms about the merits of majoritarianism. Now, that ought not to be a surprise to folks who are originalists because, in fact, in a sense, Madison's Federalist 10, which is a precursor to modern public choice theory, expresses skepticism about rapidly forming majorities. So this ought not to be a newsflash to originalists, nor is it necessarily obviously the case that originalists are uh, skeptical of majorities because you can see that it's really a question about which particular majorities we seek to credit or discredit, and that has much to do with what we determine the Constitution does or does not protect. There are plenty of Scalia opinions that seek to privilege majorities, just as there are plenty of Scalia opinions that seek to dispense with majorities. And Heller, for example, um, depending upon his view of the substantive protections, I guess the one thing I would say, John, is that the fact that somebody speaks somebody speaks originalist speak doesn't necessarily mean that they're playing the originalism game particularly well. And in fact, it is clearly the case that most of constitutional interpretation, a lot like statutory interpretation, is about filling in interstitial gaps with respect to broadly worded provisions in which one can make credible arguments consistent with the text that pushes in either direction, which gives me just one minute to deal with uh, David Haddock's really interesting paper. And let me just say this about it. I'm going to come at the very end, the part David didn't get to, unfortunately. If I, can I steal one more minute from the one I have? Two minutes. Uh, here's, the, here's the image. Ship is passing an island. The person who's a Robinson Crusoe on the island is making an allocative decision between agriculture and forestry. And the folks on the ship love the view of the forest, don't care so much for the view of the agriculture. And there is a question about whether Robinson Crusoe allocates too much to the agriculture at the expense of the forestry. And David says, well, you might think that there's an externality in need of fixing under a Kosian kind of analysis. But no, because in fact, there may be only one person on the ship who really cares about this. And that person can self-identify and negotiate with Robinson Crusoe. And I thought about this because it's so clever. And I thought, well, but is there an example empirically in the world that would help me to figure out whether that is true? And the one that occurs to me is this. I have neighbors, I look at a house, I have neighbors all around me, and if one of them has something on their property that offends me in some way, you might say, well, Stearns, you're the person who cares the most. Come forward and negotiate with your neighbor. And the fact is, the world never looks like that, really. The way it looks instead is that we have zoning laws. And the question is, well, why do we ubiquitously see zoning laws? And the reason I suspect is, although I could come forward, I might actually prefer my neighbor on the other side to be highly offended by that conduct. And I might imagine that he could hope that the person on the other side of the street could be highly offended, which is to say that there is a potential cycling problem here. And you're absolutely right to say a cost is a cost is a cost. But I would just say that you're not pushing it quite far enough. The structural impediments of cycling are also a cost. And yes, a cost is a cost is a cost. So I would say that when you incorporate that into the cost side of the Coase theorem, it's less obvious that you can come up with a beneficial contractual solution without some form of benign state intervention that we actually see all around us. Again, thank you very much. Uh, it really has been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Max. Uh, Dick Wagner, my colleague at uh, GMU Econ, and a uh, former student of Jim Buchanan's from Jim, Jim's and Gordon's days at, at UVA. Thank you, Don. I enjoyed very much reading all three of these papers. Some very interesting, very informative. I think Pete Betke's paper does an admirable job of getting to the gist of Jim Buchanan's work in terms of economics being concerned with exchange and its institutional arrangements rather than with resource allocation. After all, you might recognize that resources can never allocate themselves. Only people can do so. 
And they must do so within some framework that governs their interactions and relationships. And so I think uh, Pete, uh, along with uh, Leah, whatever the name I can never pronounce, I had her as a student. Well, she's a very fine student, but uh, I wish she would shorten her name. <laughs> but not Paula <laughs> I still couldn't say. Uh, but uh, just wonderful. I think uh, John McGinnis's uh, paper on the calculus of consent and originalism. I mean, the calculus of consent was explicitly undertaken to provide an economizing logic to the American Constitution construction that would map into a framework of what they regarded as consensual governance, which is very much different from majoritarian governance. And so, you know, I think, yeah, I think for sure that there are connections between modern interest in original interpretation and the calculus consent in the framework that it uh, uh, set forth there. And I think John, I think, explores uh, some of that, I think, in, in, in wonderful fashion. And Dave Haddock, I think the, he talked about the distinction in Buchanan and Stubblebine between credo-relevant and credo-irrelevant externalities that I think in many times when people think about uh, externalities, there's a kind of an implicit presumption that everyone is affected equally and in small magnitudes, and the sum of all the smalls adds up to something large. And that feeds into free rider kinds of claims. Uh, they points out that in many cases what you'll have is rather, in terms of affected parties, quite a, a variation where there will be, perhaps in, in law normal-like fashion, there will be one or two or three people who are affected quite strongly, many who are affected modestly, if at all. And so within a framework based upon private ordering, we would expect that most of these so-called externalities uh, situations would be externalities internalized through private agreements among the participants. And so, all three of these papers, I say, I think, raise important points. They all speak to the core of the work of James Buchanan. And I've only taken about two minutes from my commentary, and I wondered, well, what should I say now? Because I could just pile on compliments, but I don't think that would be helpful. And so I decided what I would do is to is to look at something different. I've given myself this title, James Buchanan's Political Economy, a Paradian Refraction. Now what do I mean by a Paradian Refraction? What I want to do then is to take the Buchanan's themes as these three authors reflect through their papers and ask how would that come out if you refracted that through Credo's ideas to displace uh, those? That's the kind of thing I have in mind. Why do I choose Credo in this context? Well, Credo is an Italian, obviously. Credo wrote a lot on public finance and political economy. Credo was a classical liberal. Buchanan wrote a lot about the Italians, but there was a subset of Italian authors uh, who Buchanan said very little about. Among them was Pareto, but also various kinds of interesting sociologists of democratic oligarchy and things like that, like Gaetano Mosca, Roberto Nichols, and things like people like that. So I wonder if maybe there's something that could be explored in terms of trying to refract some of the Buchanan ideas through this Caridian kind of prism, because there is a lot of, of similarity. And I do this refraction not in the spirit or in the sense of wanting to say that, well, oh, one is right and one is wrong in some essentialist way, because I'm very much a Nietzschean in the sense of thinking that the world is going to require us to look through, the, through it in a number of different windows. Because after all, what we see at any one time is itself a product or a feature of the 
a theoretical lens within which we work. And so I think to look upon a complex world is going to require a number of different lenses that are, is going to highlight different features of what we're looking at. And so, and there are other people besides Pareto I could have uh, used, but Pareto is the only Italian one in the group. For instance, Isaiah Berlin had the same outlook of Pareto in terms of there being non-commensurable values held within a society. And uh, the other person is Carl Schmidt, who was a German, who felt like Pareto, that the uh, domain of the political could never be eliminated uh, from uh, uh, social life, that there was a certain kind of economy of the political, in his case, that was due to inherent friend-enemy qualities within society, as well as always a case of exceptions arising. So I want briefly in about three or four minutes then to say something about rationality in Credo number one, two, the divergence between Credo and, and Buchanan, and three, what it all means in terms of theories of social change in relation to sentiment and reason, which were Credian themes. To recognize that Credo's started out as an economist, a free market economist, who was utterly convinced of the beneficial qualities of private order, market ordering, and found himself then wrestling with the puzzle, well, if these market ordering is so wonderful, why does it have such, is, is embraced so weakly? How can I give an account of that? And that's where he ended up writing his 2,000-page treatise on general sociology as his effort to wrestle with that. Now, in that, he makes a fundamental distinction between... Cardo, first of all, did not believe at all in irrationality as a concept. He was like Thomas Saws before his time in that, so that rationality, everything was rational. But there are different categories. What he referred to as logical action and, excuse me, uh, yeah, logical action and non logical action. Logical action was action where you could, an actor could see a direct link between an action taken and a consequence achieved in any expected value sense. Now, obviously, not every business plan works out as you might expect, but still, that there is that direct linkage. Uh, that ties the actor's action to the anticipated, reasonably, logically anticipated consequences of the action. Non-logical action, then was action where there was no such linkage. And Credo joined that with the recognition, I think, that uh, to a large extent, humans have a quality of wanting to give logical sounding interpretations to their actions. You always have to give reasons, even if there is no logical connection, that would give you reason to think that your action would produce the result that you claim to want to produce. And the scope in non-logical action became, in large measure, the uh, place where politics took place. And so that was that became the world, or the realm of sentiment, and um, Credo thought that sentiment was an important part of politics. He, he and Buchanan, I think, would diverge in terms of what kind of theory of society ultimately do you embrace? I think uh, in his, in a book called Four Sociological Traditions, uh, sociologist Randall Collins describe these four traditions, two of which are, I think, most significant for, for economists. One is what he called the uh, exchange tradition. One is what he called the conflict tradition. Buchanan, as is interpreted as a sociologist, would fit within the exchange tradition. Pareto would fit within the conflict tradition, as would Max Weber. Within the exchange tradition, Herbert Spencer would fit within that tradition. And that uh, in in response to the claim about, well, choose the Constitution that would maximize social welfare, Pareto gave the response that, well, for the 
Wolf happiness is achieved by eating the lamb. For the lamb, happiness is achieved by avoiding being eaten. And how do you maximize social welfare? And um, I'm saying Fredo's sort of formulation that society was a a situation of of competition among elites for positions of leadership over over governed masses. That's a different conceptualization of Buchanan. I say I bring this up not because of any interest in saying one is superior to the other, but saying in terms of the problems of liberalism, because Prado wrestled the same problems of liberalism as Buchanan did and thought about them, and that in the in the um, in, in the Freudian sense that you had somehow to deal with sentiment, like for instance, speaking of sentiment, if you go back to think about entitlements, think about Herbert Hoover. It was Hoover, after all, who promised a chicken in every pot. Now, what kind of language, because this gets into language, then, what kind of language do political figures use in selling their programs? Well, is it always a language that connects to the product side of the market? Something you can have. And if you're a listener, and a favorable listener, at a lower price, otherwise you would pay. That's the nature of politics. And so, all political programs, I think, make statements about the product side of the market. But yet, we know from the basic idea of equilibrium theory, that you cannot say anything about the product side of the market without making a complementary statement about the factor side of the market. And so if you're going to have a program of a chicken in every pot, you're also going to have to have a program of people going out and working weekends on chicken farms. And the two are, are complementary. Now, back though a century, a century and a half ago, uh, in terms of treatises on political economy, there was a distinction made between the science of political economy and the art of political economy. And I think, uh, I think this is something that a consideration of Pareto in relation to Buchanan in relation to political economy says that there's, there's a relation between sentiments and logic and language. That in thinking about these, thinking about these uh, three papers, uh, the recourse to logic uh, showing that within a system of private ordering as, as they've had it, Dead, that there's good reason to think that externalities would be really insignificant because of the uh, large number of cases that are in, employed here. That you might say that, well, that's all well and good, but yet others would say, I don't care because I've got the power and I, I'm going to do this. And so this question of power exchange and how it plays out, I think it's something that calls upon both the logic of freedom and free markets, as Becky in his paper talks about, making the markets better appreciated within society, which appeals to logic. But I think there's also the question of, of the appeal to sentiments or, or whatever, which I go back and closing in this vein with a, one of the aphorisms from Pascal so many centuries ago, which would be, the heart has reasons that reason will never know. And I think there's, there, if you bring the science of political economy and the art of political economy, I think that, I think all those are, are somehow at present, and it's something that really requires different people with different capacities, but I think my meditation on Buchanan and these uh, uh, three papers, and Pareto, and I might add, just in one final closing moment, is the reason I got so familiar with Prado and these Italians is when I went to Virginia in 1963, I, the language, we had two language exams in the past, and I, I passed a German exam upon getting there in the fall. The next year I passed the French exam, and I happened to see Buchanan. I told him, hey, I passed the French exam. And I think I was going to passed it. 
So that's fine, but now you need to learn to read a pattern. And, and so I did, although I was out of school, school before I did. But I think, uh, anyway, that's, that's fine. Thanks, Dick. We have uh, just a few minutes. I'll ask each of the uh, main speakers, I'll give each of the main speakers just about a minute or so if, if they want to say anything in response or reaction. Pete? Just, uh, I, I actually responding to anything, I would like to ask John a question, which is, I found his topic quite fascinating, the relationship between the progressives and the change. And I was wondering if he had looked at Vincent Ostrom's uh, work on the intellectual crisis of American public administration, which um, Gordon Tulloch, you know, got to publish through the Public Choice Society and whatnot early on, because it's about the nature of the transformation of public administration due to Wilson. And the puzzle that I find fascinating with that is how that then changed the nature of the social sciences. Because the social sciences are handmaidens to public administration. You change the nature of public administration, you're going to change the way we conceive of the social sciences and also law. And when I was wondering if you had looked at that, because that's a good inroad, I think, to maybe thinking about that connection again between those things. Uh, can I just answer? I, I, I've not looked at that, but I do think there's one important. It's about also the transformation of lawyers. Hamilton, in thinking about judicial review, thought the lawyers would be the brothers of merchants and the defenders of property. Once you create the large regulatory state, lawyers flip. Yeah. And become they see all new regulations as an opportunity to slice off some transaction costs for themselves. And so I do think that's a profound change. Well, I was, I was just I was going to close it out with a few. Yeah. I just wanted to respond to Max's interesting uh, comments. Is that I, I don't disagree that everyone speaks in different ways about originalism. Sometimes they're not being candid. And there's a disagreement among originalists about how far interpretation is interstitial or not. But I think it's important that, I don't think that undermines the point about the importance of the public choice inflection. Because one of the useful things, I think, is we see it's not only effects on actual lawyers, but on constitutional theorists. Those who aren't sympathetic to public choice, and those who are, which are generally uh, in the, in, on the left liberal side of the spectrum, they have continued to be very concerned about the counter-majoritarian difficulty. That really is now, I think, the distinctive difference between uh, uh, the different sides. And I think that only can be explained by the rise of the importance of public choice, both in its diffuse sense, and for some of us, in its more theoretical sense on, on originalism. Uh, I'm going to close it out now, but I want to relate one anecdote in, in closing that I think should be mentioned here uh, because of the nature of the, of the, of the celebration. Uh, there's another connection between Buchanan and Alchin uh, that a lot of people forget, is that Buchanan actually spent a year on the faculty at UCLA. Alchin enticed Buchanan uh, after the unfortunate events at, at, at UVA to uh, move to Los Angeles to become a member of um, what was arguably you know, the best economics department in, 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 in the English-speaking world at that point, UCLA. Buchanan went out there for a year, and anybody who knows Jim uh, is only surprised that he went out for a year. <laughs> not surprised that he didn't last in Los Angeles for years. Cannot picture Jim Buchanan driving around the Los Angeles freeways for much of his his life, but that would be it. I always have to say, if you look at the original. The, the, the original cover of Buchanan's uh, 1992 autobiography, which is entitled Better Than Plowing, it's, it's a picture of Jim sitting in his rocking chair on his, uh, on his, in his farmhouse, on the porch of his farmhouse near Blacksburg, and he looks for all the world, uh, all the world to me like a poster child for the Great Society program, <laughs> rather, rather than as a Nobel Prize winning economist, but a, but a great economist he was, as of course great scholars are the, are the other two as well. So thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for a wonderful panel. I think we, uh, I'm sorry, we uh, start again in uh, 15 minutes. <laughs>